Coming up. What could that mean for the future? It could mean that whenever the opposing party takes control of the House, the sitting president will be subjected to an impeachment inquiry. For the more than 200 years that we've been operating under the Constitution, we've avoided such an unjust abandonment of our governmental norms. I fear that we may no longer be able to say that after this disgraceful political process has run its course. Welcome back to Political Spirits. I'm your host, Franklin Rye. We still stand for the proposition that the left and the right should have a few drinks and talk. Compromise is not a requirement. If those discussions result in us changing or even abandoning our positions, that's fine. If they don't, that's fine too. We just need to talk to each other. In that way, we can unify through speech. And if the discussion becomes a bit heated, at the end of the night, we should still be able to split up the bar tab and be on our way. So what are we going to talk about this week? Let's talk about the insanity of this impeachment process, about the horrible precedent that it sets, about what it should appear to be to anyone who isn't so blinded by hatred of Donald Trump that they can't see what's going on. The Democrats have a problem. Their leading contenders for the presidency suffer from severe deficiencies. Their polling leader, Joe Biden, is 76 years old, and he acts like it. Sometimes what he says on the campaign trail literally doesn't make any sense, not just because he's mumbling when he says it, but also because the words he strings together don't create an intelligible thought. Moreover, the fact that his son took a position on the board of directors of a Ukraine-based company, known as one of the most corrupt companies in the world, based in one of the most corrupt countries in the world, right after his father, then Vice President Joe Biden, was placed in charge of the U.S. relationship with Ukraine and tasked with righting the corruption endemic in their system. And then Biden forced the president of Ukraine to fire the prosecutor in charge of investigating the company on whose board of directors his son sat. And then Joe Biden bragged about it on video. Their number two candidate, based on polling, is Elizabeth Warren a candidate so far to the left that she scares the hell out of corporate interests. Anyone with a company-provided health care plan, especially union members, and even former President Barack Obama, who recently cautioned the Democratic Party that its candidates must move away from the far left and more towards the center, highlighting without mentioning her, Elizabeth Warren, and the next leading Democratic candidate, Bernie Sanders. Now, Bernie Sanders presents a nightmare for the Democratic Party. The Republicans' plan has been known for months, if not years. They plan to label the Democratic candidate as a socialist, someone trying to destroy the history of the United States by turning it into something which it has never been and which its founders did everything they could to prevent, a socialist state. If the Democrats were to somehow nominate Bernie Sanders, they literally would be proving the Republicans' point. Because unlike Elizabeth Warren, whose proposals reek of socialism, but who nevertheless claims not to be a socialist, Bernie Sanders proudly proclaims that he is in fact a socialist. Talk about doing your opposition's work for them. So who's left? Well, Mayor Pete Buttigieg has impressed some people. The fact that his father was a Marxist professor who spoke fondly of the Communist Manifesto should concern voters, but the bottom line is that Pete Buttigieg has done fairly well on the campaign trail, and his stock is definitely rising in Iowa. But he's the mayor of South Bend, Indiana, a city of 101,000 people, and that's the highest position he's attained. Look up corporate headquarters in South Bend, Indiana. I just did. The third entry is Louis Tuck Shop Corporate Offices. That's right. Tuxedo rentals and wedding accessories. There's nothing wrong with that business, of course. But when your highest professional achievement is mayor of a city where a search for corporate headquarters in the city turns up a tuxedo rental shop whose corporate footprint doesn't extend beyond northern and central Indiana, 
you raise some very serious questions about whether you're ready to be president of the most powerful nation in the history of the planet with the largest economy in the history of the planet. Mayor of South Bend to President of the United States. I don't think so, and I don't think the Democratic Party thinks so either. So who else do they have? Well, Kamala Harris is in free fall, and if you've listened to my prior episode attacking her ethically challenged nature, I suspect you agree that she deserves to be in free fall. That's it. Those are all of the leading candidates for the Democratic nomination. Michael Bloomberg, billionaire and former mayor of New York, just entered the race, but there's nothing to indicate that his presidency is taken off with the public. Likewise, Deval Patrick, former governor of Massachusetts, just entered the race, but he can't make it onto the stage at the next debate, and likewise, there's nothing to indicate that his candidacy has taken off with the public. The Democrats are in trouble, and they know it. So what are their options? Well, they could try to find new candidates at this late date, and the entry of Bloomberg and Patrick is evidence that that's being tested. They could try to force Bernie more to the center. Can't happen and won't happen. They could urge Warren to more aggressively pretend to be a centrist. She might try, but it's a stretch to think that the public will believe it. Having said that, she'd likely have much of the media going along with the ruse so she could fool some of the people. They could wait for the convention to see if no candidate gets the majority on the initial vote and then bring in the superdelegates. If that doesn't put a candidate over the top, they could pursue someone who hasn't even run. God forbid it could be Hillary. It could be Michelle Obama. It could be any one of the celebrity ideas that have been floated over the last two years. I'm not in a position to predict that at this point. But we can see what they have done, the path they've chosen, and it's a path that constitutes a threat to the political future of the country, but they've chosen it nevertheless. They've chosen to pursue impeachment, and they've started with an impeachment inquiry so devoid of the principles of due process that even the phrase kangaroo court doesn't seem to capture the absurdity and unjust nature of the process. Consider just for a moment the fact that the first two days of witnesses had no direct knowledges of events forming the basis for the proposed impeachment, yet the Democratic leader of the committee, Adam Schiff, has prohibited calling the whistleblower whose complaint led to the impeachment inquiry, and has prohibited calling Hunter Biden, the son of the vice president whose work for the Ukrainian company Burisma was at the center of at least one of the investigations President Trump was requesting, and that request is at the center of the proposed impeachment of the president. So why do the Democrats want to impeach? Multiple reasons. First, perhaps foremost, they're likely to lose the election against President Trump in November. If somehow they were able to manage to remove him from office in the Senate, highly unlikely to say the least, they'd have a better chance in the election. Probably the only way they could do that is if they uncovered something incredibly damaging in the inquiry. There's absolutely no reason to believe that will happen. So if they can't remove him from office, what's the point? Well, they hope to tar him through the impeachment process using the news media for what it has become, their propaganda arm. Moreover, the inspector general's report into FISA abuse is soon to be released. The Democrats likely hope that they can push that report off the front pages with drama in the impeachment inquiry. Will it work? I doubt it, but having said that, it depends on their target. If they think that impeachment inquiry developments will prevent Trump supporters from focusing on the report regarding FISA abuse, they're out of their minds. What they may intend is simply a distraction to make sure that their own supporters, as well as true fence sitters, don't become disenchanted by reports of abuse of the FISA process. And that gets to the bottom of what much of this impeachment is about. It's geared towards the Democratic base, towards the Trump haters. The Democrats have been talking about impeachment from even before the president took office. The impeachment process agitates that base. It shows that base that the Democrats are doing something. Granted, what they're doing has nothing to do with passing legislation or addressing the actual problems the country faces. 
and it certainly has absolutely nothing to do with working with the other side of the aisle on issues on which they could otherwise reach agreement. But the action that they're showing their base that they're taking may satisfy that base, and it certainly may shake loose contributions. And regardless of the effect it has on the presidential race, it could insulate Democrat members of Congress in true blue districts from facing primary challenges from their extreme and agitated left wing. That search for contributions and protection from left-wing primary challenges may explain more about this impeachment process than anyone has acknowledged. And that is a shame. Impeachment was never meant to be a purely political move. The conduct identified in the Constitution as supporting impeachment was deliberately limited to extreme conduct. It did not include policy disagreements. It was never intended to be routinely employed. Yet that is what we're seeing with this impeachment inquiry, a purely political process employed to accomplish purely political goals and addressing routine conduct, in this case pushing a foreign government to investigate apparent corruption among government officials. What could this mean for the future? It could mean that whenever the opposing party takes control of the House, the sitting president will be subjected to an impeachment inquiry. For the more than 200 years that we've been operating under the Constitution, we've avoided such an unjust abandonment of our governmental norms. I fear that we may no longer be able to say that after this disgraceful political process has run its course. But you may say, how is this impeachment any different from prior ones? Well, I've talked about how the process is different. Prior impeachment rules allow the president to have counsel present in the proceedings. They didn't subject every witness to approval by the chairman of the committee. They didn't put, they didn't put the impeachment inquiry in the Intelligence Committee rather than the Judiciary Committee, where prior impeachment inquiries have been conducted. Remember, the subject of this impeachment inquiry is not a foreign intelligence matter. And this impeachment does not arise out of the report of an independent counsel or special counsel or independent prosecutor or special prosecutor. The pending impeachment of President Richard Nixon arose out of the special prosecutor's report. The impeachment of President Bill Clinton arose out of the independent counsel's report. There was a special counsel appointed to investigate conduct of the Trump campaign and administration, specifically involvement of Russia in the 2016 election, and allegations of collusion with the Russian government regarding that election. A report was issued by Robert Mueller's office, and the counsel didn't find any collusion or obstruction of justice by Donald Trump or the Trump campaign. So this impeachment is not like the pending impeachment of Nixon, or the impeachment of Clinton. But it's also different from those in perhaps an even more important way. This impeachment is arising in the first term of the president, and it's less than a year away from the next election. With both Nixon and Clinton, the impeachments occurred in the second term. There was no opportunity for the electorate, for the people, to indicate how they felt in light of the charges, whether they wanted the president to continue to serve. That's not the case here. The Democrats in the House of Representatives supporting impeachment are trying to take away the people's voice. The people elected Donald Trump. The allegations against Donald Trump are out there. The people have a say as to whether they are so serious as to prevent Donald Trump serving as president. And they'll have that say in the election in November 2020. Those who support impeachment want to take that say away and instead let the House and then the Senate decide. Every American, Democrat or Republican, Trump supporters, Trump haters, and those on the fence should find the effort to take that say away deeply troubling. Moreover, with every moment of focus on the drama of this process, a moment where the focus could be on the problems we face is taken away. Wages are rising, especially among the working class. Are they rising fast enough? Are they, ri are they rising because of efforts undertaken by President Trump? The cost of health insurance is a backbreaker for most families. What can be done to lower those costs? 
Addiction to opioids is destroying much of the heartland of America. What can be done to tackle that problem? The cost of a college education has grown at more than the rate of inflation for as long as I can remember. Why? And what can be done about it? Are college curricula designed to fulfill the employment needs of our economy? If not, why? And what should we do about it? Those are just some of the problems and issues that aren't being talked about in Congress. They aren't being addressed by Congress. They're rarely being discussed in the news media. Why? Because the focus is on the impeachment process 24-7, and nothing else gets through in the halls of Congress or the studios of the media, and that should concern all of us. Next topic. The public understands the nature of the press. Let's talk about one of the things that we've learned as a result of the Trump presidency. We've learned just how dishonest the media can be. Before the Trump presidency, I think there was more of a general understanding of the leftward media bias, but not a belief, at least not a widespread one, that it was fundamentally dishonest, that it wasn't telling us the truth. But the reaction of the media to the Trump presidency has been so extreme, so over the top, that it doesn't constitute bias alone anymore. And I've talked about it previously. The media has become a full-on propagandist for the Democratic Party. But I've talked about that before, so why am I talking about it now? Because there's now evidence that there's an awareness of that, not just on the right, not just among conservatives, not just among Republicans, not just among Trump supporters, not just among those who listen to this podcast. There's now evidence that voters across the board are aware. And perhaps most surprisingly of all, there is evidence that the awareness may be higher among minorities than among non-minorities. That is huge. So where did I get that idea? From Rasmussen Reports, which shows that 53% of likely voters believe that the press is trying to help impeach President Trump. Only 51% of white voters believe that, but 53% of black voters believe it, and 60% of other minority voters believe it. Only 34% of likely voters believe that the media is simply interested in reporting the news in an unbiased manner. Do those numbers necessarily mean that Trump will win re-election? No. Do they necessarily mean that Trump has huge support among minorities? No. But they do mean that the assumption that the media coverage controls the thoughts of the voting public is no longer valid. It means that President Trump does have an opening to gain significant minority support. As I've said before, I believe that he will gain surprising amounts of support from Hispanics and African-American males. What this latest polling indicates to me is that there's a potential for those numbers to be much higher than even I expected. And I'll be back next week speaking before all of you, and hopefully your numbers will be much higher than even I expected. And to help ensure that happens, be sure to tell your friends about Political Spirits and like the podcast on Facebook at Political Spirits, and follow me and the podcast on Twitter at Franklin Rye. And remember, all episodes are now on YouTube as well. And the YouTube channel is named Political Spirits Network. If you're watching on YouTube, be sure to like and subscribe and hit the notification bell. This is Franklin Rye. Thank you for listening.